podcast of Freestyle. Thank you so much for joining me. If this is your first time joining me, the philosophy of this podcast is to speak to the players who are shaping the metagame so that their voices can be heard. This week's voice is a pair of them. First, we're going to catch up with the Brazilian national champion. Not too many countries have national championships for Popper. I took the time to speak with Brazil's because Brazil's national champion doesn't speak English and I don't speak Portuguese. It's been a drawn out affair. In the end, I got his answers in Portuguese, took them to a previous guest of the podcast who spoke Portuguese, had him translate those into English. Thank you very much to Alexander Weber, aka Against. Those answers are being spoken by the other half of the Popper Players podcast, who is stepping in and lending us his voice as well this week. After that interview, we're going to catch up with Raptor56. He's been on the podcast before, and during that time, we discussed his brews that he had had success with in the Popper Leagues. Some interesting 5 O's he got published. One of those he refined further. Because above all else, Raptor is a brewer, and he successfully brewed his way to the finals. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Could you tell me a bit about yourself? My name is Guillermo Antonio. I'm Brazilian, and I live in Mogiguaca. I'm 28 years old, I'm married, and I'm expecting my first daughter. I'm a businessman, and I'm a junior in college. Since I was a kid, I always enjoyed spending my free time playing basketball, Dota, and Magic. But for about a year now, I've been concentrating on playing Magic only. Okay, thank you. Tell me about how you got started playing Magic. I started playing with my cousins when we were all kids. At the beginning, we played all wrong and didn't even know the basics. But with time, we began going to the card shops around us, talking with other players, and playing a little more seriously. Now, how did you get started playing Popper? And follow-up question, what's made you stay with it as the format of your choice? In my city, the most played format is Popper, so I chose to play it too. I set up some decks, ended up liking the format, and decided to keep playing with it. How did you prepare for this event? In my city, there is no store to play in, so we gathered some friends and played at home. And that's how we tested. With no local store, how far did you have to travel in order to just qualify for the final? Yes, I got qualified to play in a neighboring town. That store was called Orc Tavern, about 60 kilometers away. For the podcast's American audience, that is 37 and a quarter miles, give or take. So, quite the trek. Now, could you tell me about the tournament itself? What did you play against that day? In the first round, I lost to Tron. In the second round, my opponent didn't show up, so I won by default. In round three, I beat White Black Pestilence. In round four, I beat Boggles. In round five, I beat Infect. In round six, I beat Stompy. In round seven, I split with Tribe. And in round eight, I beat Burn. Moving forward, would you change anything in the deck? I would replace the Dispel with Spell Pierce. After that disappointing first round, right, you get the Dragon's Tron, what was your mindset like for the rest of the tournament? I got kind of mad because of the loss, because I kept a hand that I shouldn't have kept, and I got mana screwed in the second game. So I knew I had to be more focused in the next rounds, because if I wanted to top 8, I would have to win all the following matches. This was a pretty prestigious tournament. What does winning this event mean to you? I was so happy to have won. I played Magic for a while, but I always played wrong because I didn't know the rules. So this year, I trained hard, and I've learned how to play properly. And I was very happy to win the whole tournament. Generally, the podcast has MTGO players each week. Could you tell me about the difference when you're playing face-to-face against someone in real life as opposed to, you know, battling it out over a computer? Playing face-to-face is way more exciting, in my opinion. I usually bluff a lot because I play a lot of Truco. Uh, translator's note, Truco is a very famous card game in Brazil that has a lot of bluff elements to the game, but at the same time, the game is a bit more casual, being a mixture of poker and uno. Finally, can you share with us a silly sliver's ability? I would make a sliver that gives all slivers flash, and that they can counter a spell when they enter the battlefield. Okay, so kind of like spell starter sprite then, but for all slivers after the first one sticks that would be definitely an interesting ability probably too silly to be legal at least in popper that would be very very strong not exactly the longest interview and it took a while to obtain the language barrier 
was quite present. But more importantly, congratulations are due as he welcomed a child into his family between the start of that interview and the finish. There's a couple of things to sort of dissect from that interview. Back in December, Spell Pierce was recommended to be in main decks for blue decks by the Brazilian national champion. It's becoming the norm. Now, in middle January, early February, I'd say when that trend started actually taking place, usually people say that paper magic is behind online magic, and usually it's true. But I think that's a fascinating case where the opposite is the case. I finally had the opportunity to talk with someone who won a large real-life paper popper tournaments, and just as I suspected, there's a lot more bluffing. It's a lot more intricate in terms of the social dynamics and interactions of the game itself between two different people. It's a subject I'd like to explore more the next time I have the opportunity to speak with a paper champion. Now, joining us, Raptor56, discussing his runner-up finish in the format championship. Welcome back to the podcast and thank you for joining me. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to return. So before we discuss your excellent finish in the championship, I want to talk with you about the deck. Because when I spoke with Hampus, he mentioned he got his Tron list from you. So at some point, you were on Tron for this tournament. At what point did you decide you wanted to be on Rainbow Familiars? So initially... Going in from the tournament, Tron was my fallback. As in, if I could not come up with any other archetype to play, Tron would be what I go to. And I had a list ready. I believe Hamp Hughes asked me to uh, show it to him at one point, and I didn't mind. I mean, he's a nice guy. But the reason why I ended up not playing Tron was after people started figuring out what the metagame would look like, it seemed like there would be a ton of Tron. And it turns out, that was correct. I think 25% of the field ended up being Tron. And so I realized that if I'm going to be on Tron, a lot of the matchups are going to just be dice rolls because the Tron mirror feels a lot like a dice roll. And so I wanted to maybe pin it off that and look into something else. So originally I looked at Burn Man's familiar list and that was sort of what took me down the path uh, for playing Rainbow Familiars. Well, we've seen you get this list published before, or rather an earlier version of this list, although it has been a while. I believe previously you had Arkham's Astrolabe, and it looks like you just went on over to Prophetic Prism, you know, replacing that. What other changes have you made since the, you know, the previous metagame in which Astrolabe was legal? Once we lost Astrolabe, I was trying a lot of different things. I tried Manamorphos at one point, because you can actually go infinite with that. I tried Pestermite, Nightscape Familiars. I think that's about it. And the issue that I ran into with that particular iteration was that it was a little inconsistent at times, and I realized that if I were to play a four color, five color deck like that, it wouldn't work with what I was trying. So later in the year, I decided to play in a list that was playing Wild Growth instead of the Familiars. And so what that was trying to do was play Utopia Scroll and Wild Growth in order to generate infinite mana. And so that was one of the things I tried out before this tournament. And I found that against Tron, you're particularly weak against Enroma Horror because you're playing all these enchantment effects to put on your lands. And so while I was playing Burn Man's Familiar list, I found that a lot of people did not have removal for familiars. There was a number of linear decks in the format, things like modules, elves, uh, stuff like that, where if you played a familiar, it was just going to stay the entire game. So I thought that would be a worthwhile card to look at. But also, Burn Man was playing Prohibit, and that card works really well in this current format, especially when you have a familiar in play. And so after trying a couple things like that, I sort of went down the path of, I'm going to be on four Utopia Sprawls and four Sunset Familiars, and in order to sort of in the depth some resiliency, I'm going to play Prohibit that uh, Burn Man's list had, 
Tainan, Tainal, Yanu. Well, it's sort of an interesting card choice considering you expected so much Tron and that, as you noted, a minimum of one out of every four players of this event was in fact on Tron. Perhaps it's not really what I would think of as being good, you know, in that field. Could you elaborate just a little bit more on, you know, why Prohibit is so good at this time? So the reason why Prohibit, I think, is worthwhile at the time is that it helps protect your familiars in the matchups where people might have removal. So you can play a familiar, and if they try and kill it, you can cast Prohibit in order to protect your, your creature. And if they have another removal spell, then so be it, but you're forcing them to sort of use a lot of removal in order to kill your familiars, which later down the line, you can sometimes run them out of answers and then eventually have to kill them. Additionally, it's pretty decent against Tron in the sense that all you're really trying to do against that matchup is race them. One of the things that I found in the current metagame with Tron is that you should either be trying to race them or just play Tron itself. And then you're hoping to just kind of win the, the nice roll that is the Tron mirror. But the familiar that is kind of able to just go under Tron because you have the capability to just sort of one shot combo kill them. So all you really care about is things like Dispel, Pyroblast, Prohibit that the Tron network play, and you have Prohibit which answers all of those. So not only can it protect your own familiars, but it answers decks like Tron, it helps fight their potential interaction for what you're trying to do. So it serves multiple purposes, most of which I think are pretty reasonable in the current meta game. Yeah, thank you for that. So when you mentioned previously that Birdman was playing familiars that got you interested in exploring familiars. When I had Birdman on the podcast recently to discuss the previous iteration of his familiars deck with, again, the Astrolabe meta, you know, he walked us through how that deck won. Now it's Mystic Sanctuary is how his deck wins. Having no Mystic Sanctuaries in your list, could you walk us through how you do this? I understand that it's going to involve Snap, but just for anyone who's looking at your deck and maybe is a little bit confused, because I know sometimes when people see this deck, they ask, how does this guy win? So, the idea is this deck has a ton of moving pieces. The best analogy I could come up with is Clark Clan Ironworks and Modern. You have a ton of different cards that sort of help you build up to the combo turn. The, the best way I can summarize it is that you are trying to count to, to the number seven. Now, you have the interaction between Archaeomancer and Snap. Snap lets you return a creature to your hand and untap two lands. And Archaeomancer says, when it enters the battlefield, you can return an infinite sorcery from your graveyard to your hand. Now, hypothetically, if I had infinite mana, I could cast Archaeomancer, if that Snap, and then play Snap on Archaeomancer, get it back to my hand, play Archaeomancer, get back Snap, and do that forever. However, in order to even make that work, I need infinite mana. So, in order to do that, you have access to cards like Sunscape Familiar, which could use the cost of Snap and Archaeomancer. You have things like Senate Rope Chamber, which is a land that taps for one green and one blue, so it taps for multiple mana. And then you also have that access to cards like Utopia Sprawl, which allows for you to enchant a land, and then that land will tap for an additional color. So most of the time when it enters, you're going to name the color blue. So I'll walk you through kind of like a couple different combo scenarios. So let's say I have a Senate Grove Chamber in play, and I have a land that is enchanted with a Utopia Sprawl and, say, an Abundant Grove. So that land taps for two blue mana. And then I have two familiars in play, and in my hand I have one Art Hairmancer, and one Snap. So, looking at the board, I have two lands that tap for two mana. So, in total, it's going to tap for blue, 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 green. And then I have two familiars in play. So, the first familiar is netting me two mana, because it reduces the cost of our Hairmancer and Snap. So, if you count the number of mana I have so far, I have four from the lands and two from the first familiar in play. The second familiar nets me only one mana, because it cannot reduce the cost of Snap any further, but it can reduce the cost of our hair man for my one more. So now if you look at what I have on the board, I have a total of seven sort of mana in a sense, right? I count it to the number seven. So now what I'll do is I'll tap my two lands for 
blue, 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 green, and I'll play two blue mana to hard cast my Aeromancer. Now, I can get back anything from Light Rain here, and it doesn't matter. Then, with the remaining blue mana, I will play Snap and return up Aeromancer to my hand. At this point, I have one green mana left over, and I can continue that over and over and over again to get infinite green mana. Now, let's say I had a percent imprisonment play. I can filter that green mana into blue mana, and if I had, say, a ghostly flicker in play, I can flicker, you know, let's say I have infinite green mana, I can flicker our Aeromancer and the Prophetic Prism for infinite blue mana. And at that point, I can draw my entire library through each generation. And the interesting thing about this list is that that's only one of the loops. There's a ton of ways to count to seven. You can have a Senate Rope Chamber play, and a forest that has every uh, utopia scroll in your deck enchanted on that forest, and that counts to seven. You can have a Senate Road Chamber play, and you can have a forest with two utopia scrolls and a Sunset Familiar play, and that counts to seven. So once you have, so all of those get to infinite mana, right? So what are you trying to do with infinite mana? Well, the first thing you're doing is you're just trying to draw through your entire library until you find the second copy of Archaeomancer. From there, what you're going to do is you're going to take every prohibit in your list and put it in your hand, and then with compulsive research, you're going to target your opponent and then with Ghostly Flicker, Flicker 2 are Aeromancers, one of them gets that Impulsive Research, the other one gets that Ghostly Flicker, and you just keep milling your opponent until they essentially get out. It's kind of convoluted, and I know that might have been a really lengthy way to explain it, but one of the quick TLDR is, get infinite mana, draw your entire library, and then kill them with Impulsive Research. That's mostly how you kill. If you don't want to Impulsive Research them, you can also just bounce their entire board with Snap, and then meet down with, you know, our Hair Mantras and Mold Rippers. That's another option, but that's one of the general idea of how the net works. Well, thank you for the detailed guide. I think that's going to be invaluable for anyone who's looking to pick the deck up. I do have a couple quick questions about some of the numbers that you settled on. Why one Ash Barons instead of the fourth copy of Evolving Wilds. So, when I was testing, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't have, like, a great answer. It was mostly just that when I was testing the list, I was testing four Evolving Wilds at one point, and then four Ash Barons at one point, and there were spots where Ash Barons let me get ahead, where I could, uh, I needed to draw an untapped land, and I would draw an Ash Barons, and that was perfect, that's what I needed. But at the same time, there would be spots where you're looking at your opening hand, and it's like, you know, Ash Barons, Ash Barons, and that's not not pretty, that's not very capable, but if one of them was, say, an Evolving Wilds, that would be fine. And so I took the sign in, well, four Evolving Wilds is probably safest, but if I only have one Ash Baron, it can't screw me over that bad. So I just kind of went with one, because there are some spots where it's a pretty big upside, but I'll be honest, I don't have, like, a great reason other than it was a last-minute decision. Well, fair enough. In terms of your main deck, is there anything that you would change moving forward, perhaps for a different field, such as maybe a league or a challenge, one where you're not necessarily expecting the same metagame as you did for the championship? Honestly, I think the main board is pretty tight. You don't have a ton of flex slots in a, in a list like this, because you have to have all your acceleration, Sunset Familiar, Snap, Utopia Sprawl, and then you also need to have the mana fixing in Abundant Growth and Prophetic Prism. And after that, I mean, you just have to play the best card draw, you know, Impulsive Research, Monet, or you need Archaeo Mancer, and then you have to have Ghostly Flitter, so the only real flex slots are Moments Piece, Prohibit, and maybe Reaping the Graves, but you have a about six cards in the main that are flex slots, and I think depending on the meta game, you might be able to, you know, hunt moments piece and throw in weather the storm if you think that's better, or you know, there might be a, a, a particular meta game where prohibit is not very effective, so you can remove that and you know add other cards in place. So it would depend on the meta game, but you only have about six slots in the main that are flex slots, and it's it's hard for me to say what I would replace them with, but I could see a number of things like, you know, maybe Mana Morphos if I want to be really fast, and, you know, some more familiars, like Knights 8 familiars, or maybe the fourth Prophetic Prism, something like that, but it's difficult for me to answer right now, but I would say you have about six flex slots in the main that you can cut and place other cards in. Well, let's move on into your sideboard. Same question. 
Would you change anything up for a different metagame? Uh, absolutely. The one card that I did not play at all in the entire tournament was the Gorilla Shamans. I was expecting some amount of affinity, and then I never ran into it. And I found that Gorilla Shaman is not that great against affinity, because if you don't have it, like, on turn two or three, affinity typically just ignores it. I think it might be better to play something like Curfew, which is pretty good against modules, because not only does it bounce a creature, but if they have multiple creatures in play, what you can do is you can go curfew and then play our air mancer get back curfew and then replay it bouncing our air mancer and then you have essentially infinite curfew effects against them which is pretty cool and i just found that gorilla shaman is not the best against affinity i think i would probably play curfew especially because now that bot ills has won the tournament it's seen more play in league so yeah i would cut the gorilla shaman for curfew but you would keep the ancient grudge as the implication there why the split between two Gorilla Shamans and Ancient Grudge? I'm guessing the Ancient Grudge still came in against Affinity, but it is there primarily for a Relic of Agendas, perhaps? Exactly. The, the main use for it is for Relic. I don't know what it is, but people love to play Relic. I've seen people play it in the main board. I've seen people play four copies on the sideboard. And while you are able to beat an act of Relic, I, I did it in the tournament, sometimes you're not able to. And so having an answer in the main board that you can flash back if they have counter magic or something is a pretty big deal. So I just want to make sure I have an answer for Relic just in case people have like three or four of them. But it's mostly there for Relic. It's not the best against Affinity, but you will bring it in. But it, it's mainly for Relic. Okay. Could you tell me about your process, right? How did you prepare? For this event. I know you did a video on that, and I hope to be able to link that in the description for anyone curious about how you prepared for this event. But could you give me just a quick breakdown? Sure. So basically, the first thing I did was to try and be sort of data driven, meaning I would look at all of the players who are qualified, look at the history of the list that they played and then try and figure out what the metagame is going to be. And I know that players like uh, Hermie Link had a list, I think Camp Hughes had a list as well. So there were a lot of players who were doing something similar to that. And uh, looking at the sheet that I had, it, it was very similar to what they were kind of guessing. So we were all sort of ballparking what people might be playing. And after that, I kind of had to figure out what archetype is most appropriate for the metagame. So I decided to play a little bit of everything just to kind of get a feel for it. And what I found was that if Tron is going to be the most popular archetype, it's not the best idea to play a Boros deck because Tron is pretty favorite against Boros. And I also did not think it was a good idea to play a Mystic Sanctuary deck that was either not combo oriented or that did not have, you know, four copies of Slate Delvers of Saint Rips and stuff like that. I kind of narrowed down the field into what viable options might be. And it was basically either a combo net of some sort, you know, Loot Black Delver, which was very fast and efficient, Tron, or some sort of linear net. None of the linear nets were really my style. I didn't really enjoy them. Uh, not to say they're bad nets. I mean, Miles won the tournament, but it just wasn't for me. And then Loot Black Delver, while it is a fun net, I found that I wasn't the most efficient at it, and I needed more practice to get better at it, and I found myself making mistakes with it. So it probably wasn't the best thing to go with. So I decided it just sort of go towards my roots which was Tron or a combo net, and I eventually settled on Rainbow Familiars, which is a combo net that I have a lot of reps in, I have a lot of practice with it, so I'm not going to time out. And also, I think it caught a lot of people off guard, because in some of the games I played, people would just tap out, and then they would die immediately, or, you know, I could bait them on their end step with, like, a, you know, ghostly flicker or a snap, and then start a counter war on their end step, and then I'd untap and kill them on the spot, so because the net was kind of unknown, and people didn't really know what I was playing. I, ha I kind of had that edge, which I think is a pretty big deal in a tournament like that. Yeah, I have to agree with sort of both of the points that you made there. One, 
the point of familiarity where it's important to play a deck that you understand that you have the reps with. Ultimately, that was my decision as well. I couldn't quite figure out Bogles. I played five different leagues with Bogles in the week leading up to the championship, which I actually really enjoyed because on every spreadsheet that was shared with me, people had me on one of three decks. They either had me on Black Red Monarch, because I just had a 5-0 published with it. They had me on Blue Black Delver, because I just split the challenge with it. Or they had me on Slivers, because it's me. And I was like, nope. I'm on Bogles, boys. Like, I'm on Bogles. I'm so on board with Bogles. It's definitely the deck to play. And I just could not quite figure it out. So ultimately, I did Audible into the deck that I knew very well in Blue Black Delver. Would you believe me in that I had just one league with Blue Black Delver before I split the challenge with it, simply because I played so much of it last year that, you know, the new list isn't all that different. Yeah, it's got Tragic Lesson instead of Gush, and it's got Four Spike instead of Daze, but ultimately it's, you know, the same song, different dance, so to speak. So, you know, the, the point definitely rings true about familiarity. And then the other point that you made is the catching people off guard. When you have a rogue brew... When you have some tasty, unique spice, you have a huge edge because you understand the matchup that you're playing against. Your opponent is playing a guessing game. They're trying to assess what's important. And a lot of times they're going to get it wrong because they have not seen the strategy before. So they may or may not assess correctly what is important. They may or may not sideboard correctly. They certainly won't know what to expect from your deck post board, especially in this case, your deck, because it's all five colors. Who really can guess what's coming in when they play against something like that? So I think those are both very good, valid points. And I think that for anyone listening that is looking for some theory behind doing well, in a tournament, both those are really, really important theory-wise. Play something that you understand intimately. If that something is fresh, you have extra added value because you will get free wins. And it sounds like you got a handful of those in this event. Yeah, no, absolutely. There were just a number of games where people made minor mistakes and I was just able to capitalize on it. And I mean, I think in a tournament where all the players are really, really good players, you have to get the small edges that you can. Well, I mean, most of the players are really good players. They did let me participate, which was really nice of them. (laughs) But speaking of the tournament, walk me through your second place finish. What did you play against? So... I played against three Tron decks. I played against one Blue Black Delver deck, one Elves, one Boros Bully, Miles in the Finals, oh, Blue Red Flitter, that was Milster was on that. You're the guy who, who got Bilster in the top eight. No, I don't. I think I, mean, I think that was uh, Hampiers, I believe. My top eight was I played against Pascal on Tron, Hampiers on Tron, and then Hermie Lynx on on modules in the finals. In the Swiss, it was round one, Hannah Stone on Boris Bully, round two, Thias something on Tron, round three, Milster on Blue Red Flipper, round four, the Biologist on Blue Black Nelver, and then round five, oh, Ponderous on the Mount of Green Land Destruction deck, and then round six was Hercules on L. So that, that was the Swiss, and then the top eight for me. Well, I remember when top eight started, and you just said, I would like to play against anyone but Ponderous. And at that point, Ponderous was still this rogue entity where no one knew what Ponderous was playing in the tournaments until the end of the tournament, essentially. And I just remember you saying, yeah, holy crap, I'm in top eight. This is amazing. Please don't pair me against Ponderous. And I remember wondering, why is Raptor afraid of Ponderous? Like, on paper, he probably shouldn't be. Raptor plays a lot of Popper. Ponderous plays some Popper. Nothing against Ponderous. You know, he's one of my favorite guests. And uh, I just was wondering at the time, like, what struck the fear in Raptor? And having seen Ponderous's list makes perfect sense. Putting Utopius Raw on lands, eh, you know, that doesn't do too well against people trying to blow your lands up. No, it, no, it does not. I, I remember I was 3 0, and I go in around 4. I'm like, okay, if I win this, I might be able to make top mate. And then I run into Ponderous, and he goes, turn one land armor elf. And I'm like, oh no. You know, I was like, oh crap. And uh, I mean, he, he beat me pretty well, so I was just hoping it got him because that is not a good matchup at all. In terms of matchups, what other decks out there are you afraid of with this deck? 
So, land destruction is a pretty obvious one because I played a ton of uh, land enchantment effects. I think the other matchup that I'm afraid of is the Delver decks because I, I want to clarify things like Blue Red Fairies are not that bad because they do not have a lot of pressure. The only pressure they have is when they you know, turn one fairy, turn two ninja, but even then, that's that's beautiful. I I've done that. The problem with the Delver decks, things like, say, Blue-Black Delver, is that they can apply a lot of pressure very quickly, and they also have access to things like Snuff Out. So, not only do they have, you know, cheap counters like, you know, Force Might, I know some lists have even played uh, Foil, Counter Spell, things like that, but they also have extremely efficient threats like Delver, Secrets, Irmite, Angler, and then they also have Snuff Out. So, they can have very explosive draws that I just have no shot against, and in the tournament when I was playing against the Biologist who was on Blue Black Delver, he crushed me games 1 and 3 because he had, you know, the early Delver start with, you know, Disruption back up, and I was just not able to deal with it efficiently, and that was how he won the game, so I think for me it's land destruction, the Delver decks, and I think that the two that come to mind, I think anything that can race me really efficiently can also be a threat, maybe Affinity and Bottles, but definitely the Delver decks and the land destruction decks are, are the top two that I'm afraid of for sure. So actually, something interesting, you mentioned before that you would definitely switch up the sideboard for different events considering that you lost to bogles would you consider running some sort of dedicated hate something like a serene heart for example so after the tournament i was looking at my sideboard trying to figure out what was good in the tournament and what was not that great really shaman was pretty obvious it didn't do anything but also against affinity i don't think it's super great and so my mind first went to bottles because not only did that win the tournament but it's going to see a lot of play after the fact. And I tried cards like Serene Heart and Leave No Trace, but I immediately found out that they also hurt me because they destroy my Utopia Scrolls and they can also hit my Abundant Growth, so I had to try and find something that was not, you know, as two-sided that would hurt me. So, Curfew was, I think, the best option that I could find. One of the things that's nice about Curfew is that you can loop it with our Hairmancer, so you can cast Curfew, return their body to their hand, and if they have another one in play, you can go you know, Art Hairmancer, targeting curfew, and then play it and bounce Art Hairmancer and their other bot to their hand. And that's essentially a loop that you can use to keep them off of a threat. And I think that's the best option for bot that I could find moving forward, because a lot of the other enchantment hate, unfortunately, it hits me as well. So I think curfew is probably the best option for bot -ills. Yeah, that makes sense, and you're going to get a little bit of bonus value elsewhere as well if you were to play against deck like Mono White Heroic. If you were to maybe catch an Affinity player slipping, um, sacking their board to an Atog. So it does seem to have some applications elsewhere as well. Doesn't even seem like, oh, I was going to say it didn't seem like the worst thing against Blue Black Delver in the world. It's just certainly reasonable against Delver Secrets. It's quite good against Gurmag Anglers, but ultimately I guess they do run Augur Bolas, so maybe it shouldn't come in out of the sideboard for that matchup after all. Let's go ahead and turn it over to you. Is there anything that you would like to talk about? <laughs> forward because I know after I won the tournament a lot of players were like oh man it must have to get second place and all that and honestly I wasn't that bummed about it because at least for me when I play match it my sort of mentality is one I'm there to have fun but also I think when I lost in the finals it really wasn't in my control I I mean game one I mulled to four and I think you know my mullet indecisions weren't correct and then game two Kirby just had a very good draw and a lot of people who I was talking to for some reason reason they were just upset they were like you should get upset about that or i would have been really upset about that and i don't think that's a very good mindset to have when playing magic especially at like a higher level competitively because i think for me at least the best mindset to have for magic is to recognize that there is a, a, a an aspect of variance in the game there are going to be things that you can control and things that you cannot control and the things that i was able to have control over such as picking a a net for the tournament, figuring out what people might be playing, stuff like that, and as well as just playing games from magic, I think I did everything right leading up to the tournament. So, 
while I might not have gotten the best result first place, I was able to make top eight and make it to the finals, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. So I think for me, the, the best takeaway from this tournament and any advice I would offer to other players is don't be results-oriented. Focus on the process and figure out if there's anything you could have done better, and eventually you'll get the results that you want. Yeah, I think that's important that you mentioned that. One, I just wholeheartedly agree being process oriented is a much better worldview than being results oriented. And it's important to realize that you have the ability to frame your reality based off of how you choose to see things. I had this happen earlier today. It was a poor weather day right before a three-day weekend. And so a lot of people didn't come to work. I wound up eating lunch in the break room and the break room was empty. At one point, an older lady walked by and she looked in and she said, oh, it's so sad. You have to eat lunch all by yourself. And I looked up and I was like, what are you talking about? I have this whole room to myself. It's amazing. Like, I was not lonely. I saw that as a good get. I have this entire space to myself and my thoughts and my phone. And this is great. But the way she saw things is that it was lonely, that it was empty, and that it was sad. And we're both looking at the same exact circumstance. But I'm finding a positive spin to it, whereas she's finding a way to turn it sour. You know, there's always the the issue of the glass, right? Is it half empty or is it half full? Well, ultimately, that is within your power to determine. If the glass is yours, make the most of it. Make it half full. So I, I think that's a great point that you've made there. I think it's fantastic that you didn't succumb to sort of feeling sorry for yourself for tripping at the finish line. I'm sure if I had Mulligan to four in the finals of a tournament, I would have been pretty upset in that moment. I'm sure that, you know, 10, 15 minutes after the fact, I would have been like, you know what? At the start of the day, you told me you get second place today. I would have been like, deal. I'll take that deal right now. But it's different when you're in that moment, when you are Mulliganing to four. So... I'm glad that you remain positive, and I think that is a fantastic message to share. One, one last thing to add on to, and I also think, like, it's easy to forget when things were favorable for you. Like, going into the tournament, when I was going into round six, I was three and two. I had to hope to win the last round, and then hope that breakers would go my way. And I did win the last round, and then I barely made top main. I was the eighth seed. And it's easy to just say, you know, oh, that, that doesn't matter. I, it, what matters is that I got unlucky in the finals, but it's like, I was l- lucky to even be there, you know? So it's like, there are going to be things that are out of your control that go in your favor, and there are also going to be things that are going against you. So, you know, just kind of take it as it comes and think ahead. I mean, there's there's still more Magic tournaments to be played. I mean, I mean, if you look at the 2020 Magic Online schedule, I mean, we're, we're still in season one and i mean i still have tournaments to play and there's still magic to be had so you know just look forward and keep, this, keep your head up you know that's the i think that's the best mentality to have yeah i think that's an important message to share and i'm glad that of all the people to to share that message it's you and your message isn't something like wow i got hosed or you know i got really unlucky it's just that I did what I could. I couldn't have done anything differently, and I'm satisfied. I think that's fantastic. It's always about moving forward, and moving forward, it sounds like you're just going to make a few adjustments with the deck and keep grinding. Now, do you have a play of the day? I do. It was, I think, if I recall correctly, I was playing against Bill Sir, who was on Blue Red Flitter, and one of the things that I really liked about the match that we played, I think it was uh, Game 3 in, in the match, was that I was able to play around multiple copies of Red Elemental Blast and Pirate Blast with access to something like Reaping the Graves, and I was also able to set up a giant copy of Eatendrows that let me fight through his copy of Relic and Progenitus, which I thought was awesome because I was able to make it so like, he has Relic on board, I'm gonna have Eatendrows tapping out all your lands, and if you let that happen, then you're tapped out, and then I can pass Reaping the Graves any back all my stuff. But if you crack it in response, then I can still pass Reaping the Graves any back all my stuff. And so, no matter what path he picked, I basically was able to just get back everything and combo kill him, and I, I thought that was a pretty sweet line, that I was able to beat Relic without even having a, a removal card like uh, Ancient Run for it. I just put him in a really bad spot, and I basically made it a useless card. I, I thought that was a pretty sweet play. You gave him the illusion of choice. Exactly. That's the best type of choice, at least for me anyways. 
<laughs> How about you? Were there any like flip play up in your tournament? So last time when I was discussing my tournament with Hampus, it was a little bit more woe is me, and I said I just played poorly all day, and I didn't have any good plays because I refused to play competently, and I chose every possible greedy line that I could, as if this were a Friday Night Magic, because clearly so many of my opponents just like played around things and like didn't fall into the reality that I tried to spin with my greed. But I did at one point brainstorm in a way that let me flip multiple delvers over multiple turns because my mana was such that i i went you know turn one snow covered island delver upkeep brainstorm and then i wasn't i i was able to set it up to where i could flip multiple delvers over multiple turns this way by playing another island and playing another delver so that brainstorm flipped two different delvers so it's not anything too fantastic but it's the, sometimes it's just the little things, right? And getting the most out of a brainstorm is always nice. That's actually a pretty flip play. I remember when I was testing for the tournament with Blue Run Fairies, the pressure from Delver was something I always missed. And just the little things like that were, were one of the things I was like, man, I really wish I had Delver right now. Because there are some really sweet lines you can do with that card. For my silly uh, Slimmer's ability, I thought I would do with something related to Familiars. Uh, I'm going to have it so that when each Slimmer enters the battlefield, you get to untap X land where X is the uh, converted mana cost on that Slimmer. So, a little overpowered, but, you know, it's related to familiars, and I, I thought it would be pretty sweet. Well, that is certainly a silly Slivers ability. I feel like the Cloud of Fairies mechanic put onto Slivers would fundamentally transform both Popper, probably some other formats in general. You'd probably do some very, very silly things with that ability. And I do like to try to play off my guest's silly ability. So, I'm thinking about using an already existing mechanic as well. And just applying it to slivers because if there's anything that can truly break mechanics is just tanking the mods where every sliver can have that ability. So I'm going to go ahead and, and make mine a magic ability this week and just give all slivers ripple four, I guess, because I think most of the ripple spells had ripple four and they didn't really pan out too well in any constructed formats. But I feel like if you give all slivers ripple four on a sliver in a deck full of slivers, then all your cards are going to have ripple four. And you're going to get, since they've already shown that giving Cascade to a Sliver can be quite powerful, let's play the more fair version of Cascade and Ripple coming from Cold Snap. Not really known for having much going for it other than the card Scred and the Snow-Covered Lands. But if Slivers existed in that Ice Age time, you know, hopefully they would have Ripple. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing with me the story of your tournament the nuances of this very intricate and very unique deck, and just a general insight in how you see the world. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's always a pleasure. I mean, your podcast, I think, is one of the best podcasts Popper has had in a, a very long time, and it's always great seeing all the new people that you brought on. So it's a pleasure to you know, be a, a, a guest that you have to come on multiple times, and I hope to be back in the future. Thanks for having me on. And thanks once more to my guest for coming on the podcast. Fascinating deck list. Go ahead and check the description if you're viewing this on YouTube or if you find this on the main hosting site on Audioboom. Both descriptions will include a link to Raptor 56 deck list if you haven't seen it yet. If you play at a local game store, I don't know how you could resist because it seems like a lot of clicking on MTGO. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it can be an incredibly daunting idea to learn a deck so elegant in its solution to winning the game. Kind of unfortunate, really. I'm all getting to four in the finals of a tournament. But you heard him. He stayed positive. Even afterwards, he didn't lament. He was happy to take second. He focused on what he could control. Kind of similar to how the first guest this week kept himself in the tournament after a long, drawn-out game where he got the draw against Tron. Mindset and mentality is important in magic, and it's a skill in and of itself. I think that's the lesson this week. It echoed in both guests' experiences, and it's something we can all really improve on. Next week on the podcast, another incredible story. The format champion got some twists and turns in this story. I can't wait to share it with you. I've been excited about it for a while, so please do join me.